first speaker, which is Professor Heather McGregor. Over to you, Heather. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, I um, am, as Will said, um, a professor at Heriot Watt University, the host of, of this event next year, um, and I am also the um, executive dean of the business school. Uh, but I should uh, preface this by saying that I only came to academia uh, very late in life. Um, I had one go at a PhD straight after my undergraduate degree, which actually was at the University of Bradford Management School. Um, and I, um, I, I did about a year of it before I figured I could not possibly live on a student grant and gave up and went to work in commerce for the next 30 years and became an investment banker and then an entrepreneur and then I came to full-time academic life about four years ago and along the way I did a PhD an MBA at the London Business School and a PhD at the University of Hong Kong all while working full-time and having babies which can I just tell you straight away do not try this at home okay it, um, and I we're going to share now my slides with you we've got 15 minutes and I've got slightly more than 15 slides so we will be going very fast um, here we oh, we are not going to the slides. Let's um, let's try again. Has that worked yet? Can't see them yet, Heather. No. You will now. I think I think this ah, is going to perfect. work. Yeah. Mm. So um, this is what I wanted to call my my um, presentation, necessary, not sufficient. Anybody who has studied logic or philosophy will know that um, things can be necessary, but not sufficient. And uh, the, the title of a paper I've written is actually, um, is a degree enough? And I wanted to try and show to you that human capital alone will not achieve better diversity on our campuses. Um, and I'm going to talk about students, but this would apply also to staff. We're, as universities, we're much better set up for diversity amongst staff than we are amongst students. Um, but I don't believe that that um, the current state of play in universities will achieve better diversity either at universities or in the workplace. So in the UK, we've had a huge expansion uh, since 1992. Um, between 1992 and 2016, the number of people being taught in our universities doubled. Um, and in theory, this was part of a strategy to ensure that we had much greater diversity in our universities, that there would be education for all about just over 50 percent now of young people leave um, school and go into higher education. But and this is the big but when you look in the workplace and you look at what happens uh, three years out and 10 years out, um, men are still doing better than women. Um, uh, minority ethnic people are still doing worse than white people. Um, people from privileged backgrounds are still doing better than people from non-privileged backgrounds. And why is that? So they start in theory on a level playing field um, and they all, uh, as you know, many, many more people are getting degrees from right across the uh, spectrum. But why are they not doing so well in the workplace? And uh, this is my general thoughts on the subject, if you like, encapsulated in a um, in a diagram, which is that in order to create a level playing field, you don't create a level playing field of what you stand on. You create a level uh, uh, as in the, the, the thing you're standing on doesn't need to be level. The thing you're standing on needs to be at different heights in order for you all to be level. And this is a, um, a, a diagram of how I see the world, which is that you have to give people targeted support in different ways if you want to create a level playing field. And why do I say that? Well, in 2008, uh, I worked out that it was not possible um, for people to get a job uh, straight from university without having some kind of intervention if they came from a structurally disadvantaged background. And that that was why I theorized um, that there would be a difference in what students would achieve. Now, 
I, I should tell you that in 2008, I was um, an ex-investment banker and an entrepreneur with my own business that I was busy growing around the world. I'd also bought my business for 1.8 million. And in order to do that, I'd sold my house and um, and basically mortgaged everything, practically my children, everything, and um, and set up my own company. And I was asked by people, it was, a, it was an executive search firm. I was looking for people to go into jobs and nobody hired in a diverse way. And I was asked constantly for diverse candidates that I couldn't find. Now I was headhunting at the top of the sphere and I soon identified that what the problem was was that people weren't going into these, these kind of jobs at the bottom and therefore I couldn't find them at the top. So I established my own real life experiment. Now if someone had told me in 2008 that this would eventually become a, a body of academic work, I would of course have immediately um, started at the same time um, something that was that could act as a control but of course I didn't have a control you know you were not thinking about things like that when you're trying to solve a real world problem so I set up a 10-week program that delivered both human capital and social capital and this is why I wanted to do that. Here are the sources of personal capital that we all know about. So your sources of personal capital in yourself are first of all your human capital, which is what we're delivering at universities. We're delivering skills, technical skills, um, things that people do exams about, that they learn about, um, and that is what we we who stud people who study this kind of thing call human capital. Um, of course, economic capital is personal ca is a source of personal capital, and people come into a university and the workplace with different sources of and different levels of economic capital. And then people come in with different sources of social capital and um, social capital has been shown to make the biggest single difference to getting a job. The most quoted paper in social science bar none is Mark Granovetta's Strength of Weak Ties. And what he showed was it wasn't the people that you were directly connected to that made the biggest difference in your uh, um, likelihood to get a job. It was actually the people that they were connected to and your weak ties, which it, therefore what mattered was that you're getting weak ties. And of course, the the real issue here is these these two academic terms that explain so many things. So homophily is the, is the concept that people who only hang out with people like themselves, the whole birds of a feather flock together idea. And homophily shows that um, yeah, you're more likely to build relationships with people in your own environment and your and in your own culture. And as a result, you don't build out your relationships to people of other cultures, other environments, and you do not, therefore, find out about job opportunities or even the time kinds of jobs because you can't be what you can't see. And secondly, preferential attachment, which is also shown to be very prevalent and another reason why. So it, people want to hang out with people who they perceive to be well connected. And then they they don't build, you know, they try and, and latch onto those people's connections. And they are not, people are not necessarily thinking, both of these things are natural reactions and they're not strategic. They are just the default natural reactions of people to building social capital. But what I want to show you is actually that social capital is something that can be strategically thought of. And I think that we should be helping our students to um, to develop. So networks are very useful. I hate the word networking as a verb, just so that you know, if you hear me use it, I apologize immediately. Um, it, their, their benefits it help people get jobs and build trust, get better information and positively affect career outcomes. So we know all of this. This is where academics, we know all of this. It's been shown in papers over and over again. But to obtain those benefits, people need to network and um, I think this paper from Forrest and Doherty in 2004 really says it all. What does to network mean? It means to, people think of it as building relationships, but actually it's three things. It's to building relationships is just only one of them. You also have to learn how to maintain them and to leverage them. And then you can level the playing field. So the, the, if we want to help people to get these tasks then we need to do that. We need to help them learn how to do this, how to do this strategically. No, it won't just happen. And people don't like, uh, and I ha here I use this horrible word as a verb, but th this is the straight quote from the literature. So people don't like doing this and they do it inefficiently. 
So here are the three things that we need to do if we want to build diversity in the workforce when people leave university. So we need to teach people how to build a network. That That is really important. We need to teach them how to maintain it. That is just as important. It, I mean, we can, I think everybody on this call will probably have had an email from a student who hasn't been in touch with us for five years saying, can I please have a reference? And you're like, well, I, I can't give you a reference. I don't know what you've been doing for five years. You know, if you want to maintain your network, there are things that you need to do. And we need to be able to show students how to do that. And finally, how do you mobilize a network? You know, you need to know how to mobilize a network. You know, if you want to actually get people to help you to do something and to help you find a job and to help you get on in life, you, there is a way of going about that. And we need to show our students how to do this. So I just share with you as we come towards the end of this a a couple of quotes from. So what what's happened now is after I became an academic, I um, the the foundation continues. I'm no longer um, apart from funding it. I'm no longer um, involved. I don't, I'm not a trustee. Um, I still teach on foundation course. I teach one session on how to build and build, maintain, and mobilize a network to them. Um, but this, I think, is. The really important quotes that I hope you're having time to read. I would I would show, especially the second one, um, because I've gone back to all of the people who've been through the program since and interviewed them since I've been an academic. So all the people over the last four years, and the um, and indeed we also survey every year everyone who's ever been through the program. As I said, we haven't got a control, so you have to use artificial controls, which is very difficult. Um, but this second bit. You know, it's all well and good going to university and having all those hard skills. But when it comes down to it, what actually sets you apart from anyone else is connections. And that's the thing, I think. So if I could just finish by suggesting this for us all to think about. If employers don't value what we measure, which is exams, I mean, they do value it, but they also value the social capital people bring. We should measure what they value. And so if universities only give credit and therefore marks for academic achievement and don't teach and assess importantly and this is what i mean by measurement assessment so i think we need to teach and assess students capacity to develop social capital and teach them how to do it and if we don't we will never have the level playing field we need to achieve true diversity either on campus or in subsequent employment and this is a picture taken earlier this year of a group of Taylor Bennett Foundation alumni who've been through the programme and have found excellent jobs as a result. Um, I would actually take questions at this stage, but we're going to not. We are going to continue on with our uh, other speakers and all do questions at the end. Is Am, am I right about that? Yeah. And am I, I on time? You are. Under time, you're amazing, Heather. <laughs> I mean, not just for being under time, but gosh, what a fantastic um, experience you've got for your students to learn from, from your faculty members to learn from, and, and just that sort of mix of such a diverse career and then coming into academia. And, and you know, it really resonates with the early career researcher session we had on day one where they were talking about the difficulties of building networks as early career researchers that can help them um, develop further, that they can reach the people they need to reach. So it really resonated with, with that early session um, and just a, a really interesting um, presentation and perspective there. Thanks so much, Heather. We'll take questions at the end, but if anyone wants to submit comments throughout, please do use the chat. And we are, we've had a few technical issues with my next speaker, so I'm ever so slightly nervous, but I'm hoping. Um, <laughs> Professor Mayala, you're coming in. Um, you can, I can see you. Can you hear us yeah. okay? Yes, oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. We can hear you too. Would you like me to share your presentation on your behalf? Is that, that the easiest thing to do? Yeah, otherwise I can try first. If it doesn't work, so you can. Yeah, if you'd like to try, please do, yeah. Uh, looks at something wrong. Okay, no. please okay. share me. Let me have a go then. <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem at all. Just let me know when you want me to move along. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, please do begin. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, Miriala. 
from Shibara Institute of Technology, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, it is my great honor and uh, pleasure to deliver a talk on diversification strategies and approaches building upon international mindness in the university campus. Please, uh, next slide. I cannot change. Okay, thank you. From the following uh, quotes, so one can note that diversity plays a crucial role towards the fostering attributions of the critical thinking empathy problem solving and reflect to nature among the university students this is the yeah text so education in diversity helps the college campuses to improve the intellectual engagement but also self motivation citizenship and cultural engagement academic skills like critical thinking, problem solving, and working for the students for the raising, and interacting with the diverse process outside of the classroom setting directly benefited by the students. Yes. The more important aspects of diversity, university means to diversify their students, faculty and staff, curriculum, teaching methods and they must follow the programs and degrees. So <clears throat> in, in global era, the language barrier and uh, cultural differences cause significant troubles in uh, obtaining students from all over the world, especially those uh, non-English speaking countries. Hence, uh, in SIT in Japan, we formulated few smart programs that can help students to overcome the language as well as uh, cultural barriers. So in these programs, so we try to, to see uh, like uh, several programs like uh, teaching foreign students, the cultural and research uh, methodological living style Japan, and also teaching English from the Japanese students. And we have to improve the, uh, their mindset. Uh, <clears throat> next. So uh, at SIT, like a uh, tremendous strategy and efforts were implemented towards the globalized the student body mindset. And this, we created like a GLC, Global Learning Commons. This is a platform which help and assist foreign students to feel home and make the foreign friends at SIT. And also we will be time to time creating the, some uh, cultural programs as well as better understanding of the Japanese culture. And recently we started like IGP, that is an innovative global program. This is a full 100% English program where the lectures will be given the talk. And also this I type one, type two, two type of uh, programs we developed like APBL, Advanced Project Based Learning, and also Global Project Placing. This uh, we created a newly like a PhD innovative program and Sakura Science program. Apart from that, uh, to teach the English uh, in Japanese students via innovative techniques, uh, we created like English engineering program, international high school internship program. Regarding this program, I will be introduce how it will be useful to diversify the student body at university level. <coughs> Next. Okay, this is like a global learning common. Like a global learning common is the platform established global mindness and intracultural competitiveness among the university students and staff. As international students and Japanese students would continuously interact every day. Furthermore, students are encouraged to share their national holidays and conduct their events and uh, their country food, something like that. As a result, the large difference that we can see like uh, how the students uh, ability to their diversity can be improved. The, the next slide. This is the special program we created, like innovative global program, was established a first 100% research based undergraduate program in whole Japan. We can see like uh, creation of this innovative program enabled reaching a great number of faculty members from different nations, and this worked favor towards the global mindness and moreover towards the 
of course ranking projects you can see like uh, not, uh, several country like the professors we recruited like uh, france new zealand china germany vietnam usa thailand italy uk something like that and also this uh, honor program for undergraduates to gain research skills uh, in the laboratory from their first year this will be like uh, interdisciplinary study part of uh, research based learning uh, is uh, it will be give the more uh, research uh, oriented but however this is the in japan it's very difficult to recruit such a global mindset uh, staff but however uh, due to this uh, special program our university like especially president in, uh, initiated to take uh, such a bold step i had recruited the more than 20 faculty members in this program next please this is the another advanced project based learning program this is the like APBL, we can say like uh, advanced project is a two weeks research based program. The involves collaboration research between different universities to improve the scientific and technological visibility of SIT. I can say the one of the key objective is improve the diverse research collaborations, which will be very useful to improve the relation between the universities as well as like uh, research publications. In this case, just uh, we tried last year the first program, be like uh, five universities. The next time I will be explaining like that. Next. Okay. Here, like uh, blueprint of uh, GPBL. Like uh, in this program, just we selected like uh, four universities, including like IITM, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Second one is IIT Delhi, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. UPM, University Putra Malaysia, Malaysia, and KMUTT. Like that, this program total around like uh, 40 students plus SIT like 25, around 70 students are participated. This is the, you can see like, uh, this is the 10 days program. First today, the, we are discussing about the round table discussion with all universities along with the students and staff participating. Just uh, we are uh, the, uh, discussing the research program. Then we designed the research problems. Uh, we are given the roughly one, two, three, four. Then after the discussion, then the second day onwards, we are going to make like workshop. Here, like uh, the foreign students and SIT students were split into like uh, six groups and uh, completed several re research based problems. Okay. Please. Okay. This is the outcome of this program. Moreover, eight journal articles were published out of the advanced project-based learning. Without doubt, research cannot be accomplished on its own. This example strongly proved that collaboration of the critical mindness from the different countries can be enhanced toward the betterment of scientific acumen. So you can see like almost all, all are like highly reputed journals, very high impact factor within like a small period. This is only due to the <clears throat> my uh, interconnectivity of the different uh, universities. Then uh, next program is like, uh, okay. This is like uh, another program. It's like a global project-based learning program, GPBA, you can say. In terms of uh, diversification, students from different cultural, and collaborated together to solve engineering case studies as a group. One can note that uh, international cooperation, oxidative to excellence, academic problem solving is very, very easy. Actually, in this program, no, every year we will conduct once, like uh, we will invite more than 120 students from the different countries. Last year, like uh, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambria, Cambodia, Malaysia, Germany, Russia, Algeria, Ethiopia, Brazil, like that, this is the like uh, two weeks program. We will be invite, uh, but it, now normally problems will be created like uh, ordinary, like uh, environmental or energy or welfare or education, something like that. Then uh, sharing the cult. This is not only like a uh, uh, thing, like uh, sharing the cultures and existing ideas, a platform that uh, diverse groups of students working on the common problem. So this is the, one of the best program. We, we can make it like 
of course in this case like uh, we will work on a global you know industry academy collaboration based project uh, we will be select uh, and we will be the streets uh, this uh, the, as a result and uh, the student can be work uh, together and produce the best uh, results next slide please this is the another program that is uh, i can say like uh, just we, i created uh, yeah, like a phd innovative program in SIT, three years back, we started an innovative concept with our foreign partner universities. For example, this, the, this program conducted with a number one research institute in India, that is the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, in which uh, PhD students at, at SIT Institute of Technology were there, carried out their research. This uh, program has very successful and effective in increasing the number of uh, research papers and also it is very useful to like globalize our university campus uh, like uh, this is the main criteria is students from i am this is the two successful now we are working for the various universities this main criteria students from the elite universities is the very important carry out research more than three months and publish the results in the international journals that's uh, next slide please Next, okay. You can see like a uh, result of this uh, diversification towards the research programs raise the number of international co-authored papers. This is crucial for improving the all ranking projects. Apart from this strong evidence of student uh, intellectual interaction and collaboration in a cross cultural environment, encouraged them to pursue behind their level of interest. This like uh, within uh, three years, we may, we contributed more than 25 research papers in this program. It's like uh, most of the papers comes from the IIT Madras. Then now we are working with UPM also same program. Okay. The next one is like uh, Sakura Science program. This is the Sakura Science program involved as present youth uh, to short period of time to invite uh, SIT. This promote the exchange in the field of science and technology, especially improve the students thinking towards a diversified SIT. SIT. You can see like uh, this is like a one week program. Systematically, it will be arranged like uh, cultural programs, robotic workshops and field trips and uh, laboratory uh, designing some experiments. This program also is uh, beautiful to globalize the campus and uh, interface the, this uh, activities the very, very, very important. Then another program is like a short term in the English program. This program has started eight years back uh, and successfully sent like uh, 15 batches to Indian Institute of Technology Madras and Anna University. The main objective of this program was to allow Japanese students to work towards uh, shaping international outlook through the expanding on their English proficiency, cultural visit to Indian temples and industrial visit to the top corporations, learn work how the Indian culture will be worked. This is the one of the program to improve the Japanese students uh, mindset uh, like uh, globalized uh, society and also learning the English program. I think this is a well worked uh, this program and uh, another is the short term engineering English program and uh, departmental visits. Uh, this is also no this uh, toward the student thinking diversified SIT. To improve the communication skills. This the uh, one more uh, interesting program like uh, the main idea to start uh, this uh, international high school internship program to globalize Japanese universities, schools, and students, uh, further to improve the students' learning experience behind the traditional classroom. This is the two weeks program. Now the program is growing very well, and you can see like uh, every two days, we have to be some welcome parties, laboratory activity, team building activities, uh, final presentation, award ceremony, something like that. Uh, just uh, you can go next. Yeah, you can see this is like uh, as high school students from 63 different nations from the world wise attended last year. From my conversation with the Japanese university students and faculty, we encourage them to become the reflective thinkers with a strong 
emotional intelligence the acquire the aware different culture its uh, participants here like uh, not only one can like almost all 13 countries like uh, 63 students working with uh, material science laboratory and the robotic technology bioscience something like that this like uh, this program is uh, fantastic and uh, working very well to globalize our university to interact to the global mindset of the people especially like this is very very important in the japanese universities then uh, just i will give the next slide like uh, the trend how it the, the program is uh, too successful there is no doubt last year more than 63 students and 35 professors 90 tutors were participated you can see most of the students coming from the usa for this uh, such a short term program and also more than 35 professors and uh, 24 departments are participated this uh, program is uh, is the one of the important program to increase the like uh, diversity and uh, students to motivate the global direction of japanese students uh, they can learn english as well as the globalize then finally i can give uh, some concluding remarks uh, based on the experience in hosting such as smart programs at SIT, it is clear that these programs are increasing the diversity of the university substantially, both uh, students as well as faculty members. Involve the students and elevate them to improve the diversity. Easy to execute all such a programs with respect to. Give students to a global outlook on diverse cultures and working methodology is very, very crucial. And this uh, they are working very well. So if, uh, thank you very much. The next slide, please. Thank you. If you uh, need any question or comment about uh, such a program, so I will uh, welcome to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mariala. And um, just really interesting to see um, such a, a different approach to, to the session um, from Heather earlier. Um, and a, you know, really project-based learning approach, and it was fascinating to see so many different projects that are happening um, at Shabara Institute, um, where you're looking to, I suppose, provide a much more global um, experience for your students and, and diversify their their student experience and learning whilst they're with you. And, and great to see some of our other members connected with you there, IIT Madras and King Monkut's University of Technology and, and others. So fantastic. Great. We'll move straight on to our next presentation and we'll do questions at the end. Um, and those questions can go to all our three speakers today. So it's over to you, Professor Amir Sharif from the University of Oxford. Thank you, Georgie, and thank you, colleagues. And I hope the uh, technology will work now. So uh, hopefully. That looks great. Can you yeah. see my screen there? We can, that's perfect. Yeah, so you should see, hopefully on screen, uh, a very interesting picture, which I'll come to, and uh, we'll, we'll go through that. So um, I want to talk about um, this uh, interesting topic of decolonization, and, and thanks to uh, colleagues previously and, and a bit like Heather, I haven't always been an academic. Uh, I also used to work in industry. I did sort of come come late into the academic world. Uh, also worked for, for a few uh, global organizations, professional services, investment banking as well, funnily enough. And then I moved into, um, into academia. Uh, and this is an interesting um, presentation, even from my perspective, because this is more of a personal view and I'll give a, a sort of a, um, a health warning in, in, a, in a few moments. And I was asked this question the other day, uh, I think by one of my children, which was if I didn't become an academic or be an academic in in business, which is what I am, uh, what would I have done? So I think I probably would have would have would have been quite interested in doing art history. So you'll see lots of pictures and you'll see some 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 artwork. But there's a there's a reason for that. And I'll, I'll come to that. And if anybody knows uh, who painted that, I'll I will tell you who it is a bit later on as well. Then please do chat it in the uh, in, in the chat, uh, and of course happy to take questions as we go along. So hopefully the technology will work as I proceed through. So um, just first of all to say that as uh, as a university, University of Bradford, uh, this idea of diversity and indeed of inclusion is something that is in in, in our heart, it's in our DNA, and and it's great to hear and see. Uh, 
fellow partners within the World Technology Universities Network echoing that. And I know that all partners have similar commitments as well. We've been very, very fortunate at the University of Bradford to have been recognized for our inclusivity agenda. But more importantly, beyond the agenda is actually reality. Uh, and we, we didn't really set out as such to have a, a um, uh, identified strategy for it. This is who we are. This is us. It's literally in our in our in our branding, but it's also very much on our campus and as part of our student body, us and also our staff body. So we're very very proud to be the 2020 University of the Year for Social Inclusion, as identified by the Times and the Sunday Times newspapers here in the UK. Uh, prestigious to be uh, prestigious rankings, as as many of you will know, and that's really really nice. And that the main thing about that is that this is something that's very authentic to Bradford. So we're very proud of that. We're very proud of our students and our staff as well and our wider partners, because this issue of diversity and inclusion, equality as well, it lies at the heart of our society at the moment and actually needs to be um, uh, a lot more promoted, but also a lot more understood. And, and that's really the, the, the wider context there. So I think we, we, we all we all can uh, sort of take that as 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 the given context. But, but firstly, <laughs> I, I need to give a bit of a, a bit of a warning. But don't worry, it's nothing nothing serious, or nothing dangerous. Certainly, certainly not. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, this is not really my area of, of expertise. I'm just giving a view here. But I, I I wanted to do that because I'm trying to grapple with this thorny issue of decolonization and indeed within the wider discussion and debate around diversity. Uh, Heather mentioned levelling up as well and uh, equity of access that's not only to education but jobs, employment, health as well, health equality, food, water, energy, all of these different types of fundamental human resources if you like, fundamental human needs are really important. But I just wanted to say at the, at the front of all of this I'm not an expert in this subject um, but I'm trying to understand and share with you my understanding so it's, again a slightly different uh, take on on, on things uh, from my normal academic sort of uh, home. So this is about my understanding and and trying to bring together some of the literature and some of the debates in the area. It won't be very very um, heavy on 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 technicalities of things. And just the other thing to say is I might be wrong. Um, it's not so often you hear academics say that, but I'm going to certainly say it. I might be wrong, so I apologise in advance for any errors or misinterpretations. But this is an emerging debate. It is an emerging area and I'm also trying to make sense of it as I'm sure many of you are too. So just giving you that uh, that that notice up front. But let me continue. Continue. I think a lot of the debate and a lot of the action and a lot of the indeed emotion and realization about what uh, decolonization is uh, really arises out of uh, a 50 or even a 500 year um, stretch of understanding of how societies and civilizations work. And I think one of the things that I found and certainly trying to understand from a historical perspective, where where does this debate emanate from? One of the key aspects or one of the key roots was in the work of uh, Franz Fanon, uh, who some of you may have heard of, and his book, which came out in the 50s, I believe, uh, in terms uh, set in the context of the uh, Algerian war, which is civil war, but of course, the colonial input there was uh, the French context. And that really was, seems uh, seems to be a really seminal work in terms of this idea of decolonization. What does it mean? What does colonialism mean uh, in, in the modern uh, or the postmodern context? And that's really where most of the ideas have sort of come from in, in, the, in, in, in current contemporary times. That's the sort of the background. More of the foreground has been in terms of um, other colleagues within the academic space, certainly in the UK, and I'm, I'm picking just one individual here, uh, Sadhvi Dar uh, from Queen Mary, who's been at the forefront of uh, this, this debate around decolonization, but also in terms of activism and some of the elements of how uh, academe and academia, the academy itself, should be looking at it itself and, and developing and, and going beyond uh, notions of equality, diversity and inclusion into decolonization. Uh, so all I'm giving here is a sort of a broad brush landscape. Again, a bit like a, the, the pictures I'm about to show you. It's a painting. It's a picture. I certainly don't have any um, uh, particular 
uh, view or support or endorse any of these positions, but this is just my understanding. And I say that very clearly because, again, it's not my area of expertise, but these are the sorts of debates and these are the sort of elements and concepts that lie at the heart of decolonization. So, so we need to understand this word and it is out there. There is a lot of there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of emotion, but there's a lot of understanding that needs to be done in order for decolonization to be part of the university uh, portfolio, I guess, or the university landscape. Uh, because we are a, uh, a, knowledge, a knowledge society in part, in every, each one of our universities is a small knowledge society, and that is a reflection of the wider society, and of course, that we, we need to reflect what's going on in the real world as well. So this is a complex, um, challenging activism idea, uh, which is really talking about the undoing of colonial impacts uh, for, on, on, on the past and colonialist structures. And it includes some, some very deep and um, uh, technically complex uh, debates around the thinking about what colonialism is, um, not just internationalization, of course, but colonialism um, in terms of hegemony, subservience and, and the, the negative and you know, unfortunate aspects of that which have occurred over many, many years. Again, I'm not giving a view whether it's right or wrong. This is just sort of my understanding of what this, what this is. And it's about reflecting and revising and introducing different voices into not just history and historical context, but our present postmodern context as well. So that's about experiences, <coughs> excuse me, around countries that may have been dominated by others in the past and about cultures which may have been changed or impacted as a result of that. And within curricula, and we're talking about obviously within the academic uh, context here in terms of uh, decolonization, this really is about some, some actually quite simple but important impactful things. It is about questioning the source of which viewpoint information is coming from. Uh, you know, in, and, and there's, I can't remember the, who said it, it may have been a, a Greek philosopher or, or, or even a Roman general who said that you know, history is written by the person who's, who, who is holding the pen and history is written by the victor. And that is important because decolonization is about understanding which viewpoint that history or that context has been created from and interrogating that, critically analyzing if this is from a colonialist point of view or not. And it's also about several other things. It's about addressing structural inequalities, whether that be within the acad uh, academy itself or within the wider society, the business world, within policy making as well. Uh, but also if we're talking about um, uh, curriculum and learning and teaching, it's also about who is teaching and uh, not only what they uh, who is teaching, but what is being taught. Is it from the perspective of the victor or vanquished? Now, here is where we get into a slight challenge and, and problem even, because um, if you're looking at STEM subjects, for example, and I did engineering as my first degree and, and, and I was an AI researcher as well for my, for my PhD, there's not that much co um, colonialism in those subjects because it's either maths or it's, it's, it's um, uh, uh, theories which are based upon scientific uh, arguments and scientific uh, methodologies. However, in the humanities, this does become a challenge and we have to be very, very careful about this. Uh, so we have to see what perspective content and context is, is coming from and, of course, how it is being taught. Now, this is really important for pedagogy and for curricula because normally um, we could say normally a student might say, well, they just acquire received wisdom. They're told to read a book. They might come along to a lecture or a seminar and they might get presented with a case or with uh, some other material and they have to make sense of it. But actually what becomes increasingly important is um, this idea of testimony and so understanding where and who those voices are is equally important. Now uh, as a professor I've got way more slides than I, than I need to have and I've just been told I'm, I've got five minutes less, so it's left so let's see how fast I can go. But for me then there's, there's sort of three, the three C's of uh, the decolonization debate, context, curriculum, and uh, challenge and complexity. I'm just going to leave those things up there. So obviously at the moment there's a lot of, lot of activity, a lot of anger as well, but a lot of, a lot of um, clear uh, discussion about what colonialism and post-colonial 
uh, impacts have been on society and also within education as well. But this needs to then feed into curriculum. But we must also uh, look at the challenge and complexity of what this whole decolonization word and debate means. So now I'm going to move into the pictures and, and, and this, is some my, this is my art history bit. I'm now taking, I'm going to take five pictures from the work of Thomas Cole and this is uh, from his series of paintings which was called The Course of Empire which I thought was quite uh, quite apt actually for this for this particular discussion. So really what is this about? So decolonization, so it's, it's a radical, some would say even antagonistic or disruptive agitation to to uh, to the education system we need to be aware of what that means and the debates and and indeed the discussions that students might want to have with us and we should be open to that and really it's about dealing with contested identities and access to learning as well over periods of time My, many of these things may well have been addressed by by now of course but and as, as you see these pictures as I scroll through this is about how empires rise and fall and about even about how knowledge uh, develops over time and then and, and then decays. A lot of the ideas here within decolonization then are about well where does that ownership lie of decolonization and some people say this should reside with experts in the area of decolonization or indeed uh, policy makers certainly academics but also with students as well and there is some element of this which is clearly uh, around um, particular viewpoints of different colonizers. So that might be with uh, arguments based around uh, whiteness, privilege and uh, exclusion, which would have happened in the past. Some would say even that's now even now happening in our present as well. And what can we do to, to, to mitigate that? And this is actually about the argument goes that this is going beyond uh, EDI, equality, diversity and inclusion. So it's quite a complex and thorny subject. And in fact, the positive of this is that you can we, we can view this as an additive, not a subtractive act. OK, this is something about uh, dealing with social structures. And I'm glad to hear uh, and see from uh, what Heather's presentation. This idea of social capital is really important. Making those engagements, the strength of ties with our networks, with our communities is absolutely important. And I know, of course, the University of Bradford is committed as a civic university to a civic community engagement approach so we're not completely disassociated from our social communities but we have to understand how they work as well but in order to do that that needs to be somehow ultimately funded and needs to be resourced to to, to make this change occur so that we bring in a, a greater awareness of different voices into not only our curricula but into how we work with uh with with communities and universities therefore need to be at the front of the action not not at the back of it otherwise something like this might occur. Now this is this is the picture from um, a book I've got on my shelf uh, in my room here, my study, which is Fernand Brodel's book on uh, on civilization. It's the picture of destruction, the destruction of an empire. And of course, this is quite apt because if we don't deal with and don't understand what decolonization is, we don't want to be in a position where uh, our academic um, our academic expertise is, is put into question such in such a way that we, 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 we don't have an input into even this debate. So we need to avoid the what I would call a bitterness battle. It's not about that, uh, but it is about things like attainment uh, for different communities, for the BAME community, but also for other disadvantaged communities, whether they be refugees, uh, whether they be from other disadvantaged or deprived uh, sections of the community, where we can actually include them uh, as well as in, 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 our, in our wider education uh, uh, objectives. So having that diversity is really important. So greater impact is required across the entire educational value chain as well. It's not just higher, it's not higher, just higher education. It is, of course, tertiary education, secondary, primary education as well, as well as the lifelong learning sector. Um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to miss out on any of those things. Just want to end, I know my time is up, but I just want to just give you leave with this this last picture. It's no, by no means an answer, but it's just certainly my my view here, just to stimulate further debate. Decolonization is a complex system, which has complex historical roots uh, in terms of uh, culture, civility, and commerce, and then even the, even the more darker side of it, which is in terms of colonial impacts of subjugation, stigma, and these days it is about statues, but that's just a very activist. In, uh, impact and reality that we've, uh, we're seeing now. And a lot of this is around about where where we go with decolonization. I certainly don't have an answer here, but this is, seems to be 
uh, how things are developing. Uh, there is a lot of talk about revisionism, revising our history, but of course, if we're thinking of, uh, of, of knowledge as an empirical fact, as an empirical uh, asset, then surely all histories and all knowledge needs to be preserved, not just certain parts of it. That's certainly my view. So we need to be careful about that, and that's a complex, complex debate. I'm just going to leave um, these few bullet points up here. Uh, again, they're by, no, they're by no means answers, but I think these are some interesting and valuable, uh, what I believe valuable points from what I've seen and heard in the literature, but also in recent debates about decolonization. Uh, it has to be ultimately driven by not just ac academics, not just by universities, but by students in the wider society as well. We need to encourage a wider diversity of role models to, to appear. And we also need to work together ultimately um, to address de decolonization. And a really important point, just the absolute last point to end there. I think what, from what I've seen, this is about action, not necessarily all these words and, and pictures that, that I've displayed there. So I'll leave it at that. Um, slightly controversial perhaps, but it is a debate of our times. And as universities, we need to be, and I'm sure you agree with this, we have to be responsible to uh, deal with the, the debates and the society within which we work and operate. So thank you and ha happy to take questions uh, later. I'll end my slideshow there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amir. And, and you know, how, how brave of you to put yourself forward when you're saying you're not an expert in this subject and, and you're offering your personal opinion. And it was um, really interesting to see the three different approaches from each of our speakers. So, you know, Heather's really focusing on that sort of network of social capital and how it positively affects career outcomes and how we can use that to diversify our, our um, academic teams, our leadership teams. And then from Miriala talking about some of the projects at Shabaura that look about um, global students, really global citizens and how they can have cultural learning alongside their academic learning. And then really focusing with you, Amir, on the decolonisation agenda, which is is huge at Bradford, and we, we have Professor Udi Archibong leading that piece of work for us, who's also been a speaker at the Congress, but um, really reflecting on sort of that disruptive nature of how we need to, to make changes and, and, and diversify our universities and deal, deal with the decolonisation agenda. So I'm opening up to questions to um, our participants now. You can do that by raising your hand, which is like looks like a little high five thing, I think, at the top of the screen. Um, to any of the the speakers, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, and you can also make any comments in the chat if you'd prefer not to have your microphone on and be heard. So it's always the the awkward bit when it's kicking off. Does anyone want to to raise a hand? Oh, actually, Amir, sorry, we did have one comment um, about the painting. I think um, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, am I? Maya Sodov. Was that the painter? Uh, no, I, I gave the answer away actually oh, in did? the presentation. It was Tom, and I said it as well. Uh, but thank you, oh. um, uh, thank yeah. you for the uh, for that. Uh, it's actually Thomas Cole who was. Uh, Thomas Cole is interesting. Before before I hand back to you, so Thomas Cole was a, was a, was a British painter who actually emigrated. So he was a, a immigrant to America, and he was he was actually viewing um, he was um, the 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 growth of the birth of America. Uh, a colonial, a colonialism view on a colonial power emerging. So that's why I used Thomas Cole. There was a reason for for his pictures. But anyway, thank you. I think Shirley, our vice chancellor, <laughs> chatted that. So thank you, thank you, Shirley. But it was Thomas Cole. <laughs> so do we have any questions? I've I've got quite um, a few um, observations and questions, but I want to give. Here we go, Peter Schaff. Peter, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Peter's from TU Ilman and he's the chair of the World Technology Universities. Uh, over to you, Peter. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Peter. <laughs> so, microphone is okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this uh, this very interesting uh, talks. I I have just a comment. Yeah, just a comment. Um, uh, I like very much the the, the views which uh, have been presented during uh, this session. I, I share uh, I share this, these views and these viewpoints as concerns uh, diversity. I think it is very very important for the higher education area uh, to be diverse, and I think the, the 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 reason for the necessity to have a real diversity uh, is taught by nature, just by nature. If you have a look 
to natural systems, um, they are only stable. This is a rule. Yeah, they are only stable if they are diverse. Any sort of, of monoculture yeah, at the end will fail. Yeah? We can learn it from the different, different uh, areas of science and different areas in nature. For example, uh, um, the composition of, of, um, of, 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 uh, uh, yeah, of trees in, 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 in the woods. Yeah? If you have a monoculture, yeah? only Christmas trees, for example, yeah? This is not a real stable system. Yeah, it will fail. Yeah, so we are taught by nature to be to be diverse. Yeah, so it is no doubt uh, at all that diversity is what we have to um, to, to 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 go on. And and uh, I'm very proud to be a member of this network, which uh, brings this idea forward. So thank you very very much, all the contributors to this session. I, I like uh, your contributions very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So perhaps in some institutions where there's a lack of diversity, we're not stable. <laughs> That's uh, an interesting thought. So does any of the speakers have any comments or I want to add anything further in on that point? No, so I, um, we've got a question in the chat actually from Professor Shirley Congdon. So how can we do more to create spaces for these complex and contested debate? Um, Heather, do you have any comments on that? Any ideas? I think it is really important to have um, lots of stakeholders engaged in the debate. And I think, again, it's a bit like creating social capital. It won't just happen. You do have to, as, as Shirley says, you have to actually create these things. You have to, So I would strongly advocate having a champion in on all our campuses who was, I, I sort of, again, I'll go back to, you know, we value what we measure. So if you, if you make it someone's job, um, and um, and tell them they're going to be measured on it, then I think we will, uh, there will be proactive opportunities. People will proactively get the debate. I know that there is a big issue about no platforming and it's very difficult to get all sides of a debate on that. But, I, but going back to how do we get anything done in a university, as far as I can see, you've you got to make it someone's measurable job. Um, I, I, I give a parallel, but not entirely Think example when when I arrived at the university we um, we had a, a lot of we still do have a lot of adjunct staff and a lot of stakeholders when you map the stakeholders of any uh, part of a university if you include external examiners people who help marking um, honorary degree holders uh, it, it's an extraordinary mix of diverse people and they never or rarely are is anybody responsible for looking after them as a community and so i designated somebody within the business school to look after our wider stakeholder community and told them that it would be in their personal development review that they would be measured on this and lo we now have you know endless stakeholder engagement um and they are all you know, engage with our newsletter and they have even these days virtual events to meet each other and so on. And so I do think if we want to create a space for debate, give it to somebody as a job and tell them that, you know, let's have three opportunities a year or whatever and you go away and organise it and it, you will be partially assessed in your citizenship uh, area on this. Is there any other institutions? I know we've got quite a, a varied... Uh group of people on here is other institutions have a role that is dedicated to it that is measured against it or um, it often tends to fall into many people's roles but without much I suppose accountability or, or measurement in some ways. I, I, just to add to that and I, I, I agree with uh, I agree with, with Heather on that and I think what you said there Georgie is also is also true as well I mean, the short version, I guess, would be we're all we're all accountable. There, there is obviously somebody who's ultimately accountable, but we're we're all we're all accountable. We're all part of the academy, and we're all part of the enterprise of education and and, and knowledge. Going back to Shirley's question, I think that's a really interesting one, and and, and it's it, it's it's slightly challenging because one of the one of the aspects of the whole of this debate, certainly for decolonization, is um, the answer to that question would be go and find it. Um, there are natural safe spaces out there and there are natural 
fora for, for, for these discussions and for these actions. I think one of the challenges for universities today, uh, and this is again my observation, I might be wrong, is that we might not know where to look, but these things are actually happening out there. Now, the extent to how we, how we engage, whether it's through designated individuals, uh, stewards or champions, whatever we want to call them, um, we have to realize that the, our student bodies in all of our different countries that we exist in are very active. They're very engaged with their learning. They want to be, even in this challenging time of pandemic, if you like, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if you like. So we have to actually, so part of this, I think, is also being being like scouts. We have to go out there and we have to find where some of these spaces are and support them. And what some students are looking for, and I've, and I've heard because my, my daughter has also just started at university this year as well, when, when this debate has been just emerging, what students are actually looking for is they want sort of some sort of endorsement or some sort of recognition that they exist, not necessarily for the university to, to barge in and, and then overtake uh, those bases, but just to say, yes, we hear you, we see you, we know you exist, you're in a safe space. And I think um, even if we do that, that's, that's, that's a really positive thing. Thank you, Amir. Do we have any other questions? Do feel free to raise your hands if um, anyone wants to bring one in. Uh, Peter, back to you. Don't forget to unmute. Oh, yeah. Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question to yeah, any of, of our speakers. Uh, what is your experience uh, as concerns the anchoring of diversity, I think in an institutional sense, in your uh, institutions? Uh, do you have some 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 resistance, yeah, uh, from 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 coworkers, or is it let's say uh, is it uh, uh, broadly accepted? Does anyone want to take that? I'll perhaps I'll start off. Uh, so thank you, Peter, for that for that question. Um, I've been at University of Bradford now for three years, uh, just a little over three years, uh, coming from in the UK. And then previously to that, as I mentioned, from, from industry, I can safely say that our university, University of Bradford, is unique in my eyes because we have a very, very collegial culture where we have a diverse staff body, we have a very diverse student body as well. And so again, as I mentioned in my presentation, these ideas are not alien or unusual to us. It's simply because that's how we are, that's our, that's our institutional makeup. Uh, and you know, um, with with colleagues such as our vice chancellor, uh, Professor Shirley Congon, who I know is on this this call, but I, I'm not saying it just because Shirley's here, but because it's a fact. Um, through senior leadership from the vice chancellor's office, but also in terms of uh, other colleagues who are charged with leading our diversity uh, and inclusion initiatives, Professor Udi Archibong as well, right the way through to schools and and, and individual colleagues. There is a deep sense, I feel, certainly at our university, that this is something that everybody gets. Uh, and it is almost immediately day one when they work in the, walk in the door. It, it's not something that we have to work hard on, but we obviously want to make sure people are, are aware and, and uh, encourage uh, greater development and uh, awareness all the time. So for us at University of Bradford, sorry, it's a long rambling answer, it, it is just to say, it is it's something that's very that comes very natural to us. I haven't yet seen in the time I've been here any any pushback or any negativity on on these points. And, you know, and again, as uh, within uh, as a as a colleague within the School of Management here, and I know Irene, Dr. Irene Chu is on this call as well. We are signed up to the uh, UN uh, principles for responsible management education, um, which is really important for us as well, which which reflects the rea reality of how we teach and how we engage with our students and community. So for us at University of Bradford, it's it's something that's very natural. I, I don't personally see any 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 challenges to this. Sorry, colleagues, Heather, I don't know if you wanted to add. Well, I was going to say that, you know, I, I this is my first uh, full time at university. I was a, a visitor at CAS before this, but I um, I came to a university that operates on three campuses uh, across mm -hmm. three um, different continents and you don't you know when you graduate from Harriet Watt you do, don't get a, a degree certificate saying that you came from the Dubai campus or the Malaysia campus or the Scottish campus it's all one campus um, and the um, 
the, so I think diversity was something that wasn't just embraced, it was actively pursued. The other thing is that I, I, I run in my business school was the, la the largest distance learning MBA program in the world it, with students in 160 countries. And nearly to, at the moment, I've got about 10,000 active students in 160 countries. And when you are dealing with that level of diversity all the time, uh, it, it, it's a you know it's very welcomed um, to, to feel that you're having that kind of impact. So I, I think education is a special sector, though. I think that education is a sector where diversity will always be welcomed and encouraged because it's a group of intellectual people who understand the benefits that diversity brings. I, I think that ed education, higher education, has to pave the way for the rest of the world. Georgie, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yes, I fell to Peter's trap there and uh, muted myself. Um, Mary Ali, would you would you like to add a comment there, or should we go to our next question from our comment from Shirley yeah. Congdon? Yeah, actually, no. Uh, diversity plays a crucial role uh, in, especially like uh, non-speaking countries, like uh, mm. non-English speaking countries, especially for example, uh, Japan. I'm also working for the long time here. This uh, one of the major is issue is the language, and also like uh, cultural aspect. Too. Those people are coming like uh, foreign students. It is very difficult to mingle very beginning. That's why SIT is designed several programs to overcome such a barriers, and also we are training our students to the English speaking, improve the English speaking skills. Mm -hmm. In that case, also just to we, we cannot make it like okay a real class just when we are doing like some specific programs like short term then we want to motivate uh, global mindness global mindset you know the students as well as uh, uh, foreign students that's why we created like glc and igb programs especially like uh, is working like gpbl global project based learning is working very well even though Japanese students are uh, want to learn English and mingle the foreign students and making a program too successful. Last year, we did like more than 120 programs like the JPBL, various countries, various partners. And also just uh, we are inviting like uh, not only short term, we are also inviting long term. And that's why Japanese government introduced like uh, top global university program. This is uh, totally funded by the federal government. Just we are utilizing such a funds and we are making our Japanese students to the global leaders, global mindset. That's mm -hmm. I can say it's a little bit difficulty to make them like a, such a process. But now we are working very hard. We are doing in this direction. Yeah, I think it's yeah. like uh, working uh, what we are doing, uh, some specific programs, what I presented. It's like uh, fantastic, really working well. Yeah. Those projects were, were obviously a, a response to a very different context you work in where um, you're having students coming in with and in an, where it's not an English speaking university and trying to um, bring together that culture and, and share that. So uh, Shirley, I'll, I'll come over to you. Uh, thanks, Georgie. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that I think I think after this event, I want to get together with Amir to talk about his slide and his three C's and his three S's and his three V's and his three R's. Um, it'd be great to talk about that. But I do think it's getting increasingly um, important that universities step up their um, their approach to equality, diversity and inclusion because there's the a complexity emerging that is probably more complex than we ever ever imagined and at the minute you know we've what we received in the uk from our minister of education gavin williams each vice chancellor just this last week a letter saying that if we didn't sign up to the definition of anti-semitism there would be consequences now previously universities have you know, and we still do. We're a place for freedom of speech. And um, Heather mentioned the issue of sometimes being accused of no platforming or students' unions being asking for no platforming for certain voices. So 
all of the issues, I think, with, you know, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, Black Lives Matter, etc., are all reflecting the, the issues that Amir and others have talked about in this session. So we've got to very carefully manage how we do enter into these debates and our positions and do we just sign up to every um, definition of different groups that are really, really important or do we stand fast to our position of freedom of speech and a place where we want to engage in con contested debates and provide that platform where we we can bring to bear our uh, convening power and our intellectual power to invite people into that space. So I don't know what the speakers think about this because it's de definitely uh, with the lenses on us in a, in a way that it's never been before. Absolutely, thank you, Shirley. Can I invite any of our speakers to to respond to that, and and perhaps at the same time, if we make some closing comments, we're coming up to time. Um, anyone want to go first? I'll I'll go first. Um, and thank you, Shirley. Um, and I have, and by the way, for everybody else's benefit, I did I haven't shared my presentation with anyone, so uh, <laughs> this was this was this was totally um, totally my own my, my own views. Um, but happy to share that, of course, uh, with yourself. Uh, Shirley, I think just in 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 summary, my my own views. I think there's uh, again this network. Let's talk about the network. I, I think we've got some fantastic examples of diversity, inclusion, and internationalisation. You know, uh, and I was really intrigued to hear from Murali Dar what, what he's doing there in in Japan. Um, that's great. We need to have a chat, and also Heather, we need to have a chat as well about some of the stuff you're doing in in your your business school. We're doing similar things, and I think we can all share as a network some of these activities wouldn't it be great to have a three-way or multi-way um, student engagement that that's the power of the network so that's that's one thing and i think you know uh, given, given what shirley said as well this is a complex emerging debate um i mentioned it as well certainly uh, universities need to be involved in it uh, and i think we do need to be careful about um what we what we specifically sign up to, because uh, the challenges of, the, of of the whole of this this debate is that uh, if you if you sign up for one particular thing, you might be excluding some somewhere else, and and this is the problem of what they call the other. We don't want to exclude the other, so we have to be pluralistic. We are educators ultimately, but we're also part of our communities. So I think that a solution, if there is one, is is trying to work a lot better with our communities and understand our communities. I know that's something that Shirley is certainly keen to do at the University of Bradford. We are a civic university and I think that really, for me, is, is the key to, to, to all of this. Thanks, Thank you. Mia. Um, Heather, can I invite you to, to comment and, and perhaps give a closing comment for the session? Oh, thank you. What a privilege. Um, I, I totally agree with Amir that uh, actually if we can achieve this much on our own, imagine what we could achieve altogether. Um, and, uh, and also what Shirley said about the fact that, you know, we need to really step up to the plate. I said earlier that I thought that universities led the way, but universities need to lead the way because we are working with young people at a very, very formative time of their life. And it's really important. I, 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 we run a, an honours year course in diversity and inclusion. And one of our students wrote to me recently and said, please, could we um, actually run this course in the first year? Because it was such an important thing and that they felt that everybody should should it should be a compulsory course in the fourth year, not an option in the fourth. And I thought that actually, you know, that that's a very good point. Um, th this is something that we all need to do. We all need to do it together. Um, and as I said, if you if you don't, uh, you know, measure it, people won't think it's important. Absolutely, Peter. I could see your hands gone up, but we've really reached. Time. Yes, uh, yes. Just just just, just, just yeah. uh, <laughs> very shortly. I think uh, uh, um, as a consequence of uh, especially this session. I would uh, like to say that uh, a motto for us, for, for WTUN, could be a sentence which was, uh, I think, uh, said by uh, Professor Richard Williams, uh, Vice Chancellor of Harriet Watt, yeah, uh, yesterday. And this is, uh, we stand for uh, bringing forward scientists of the world. 
Yeah, I think this could be also a very good motto for WTUN. Yeah, we are bringing forward scientists of the world. Yeah, I think it's, it would be great. Yeah, if this is the this is the result of our activities, wonderful. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you. We'll, we'll end here. Thank you to all our speakers for bringing such a, a well a diverse view into this this session on diversifying our universities. I think it was a, a really interesting and varied discussion. And thanks to all our attendees for your questions. It will be available on on the website later to watch back. But for now, I'd like to thank you all and say please do attend the next showcase session, which starts at 10.45, where you'll see some of our exchange students and I think a student competition as well, talking about some of the activities of the network before it moves into a development session at 11.15, where there can be ideas, where we uh, talk about how we might take the World Technology University's network forward in its development over the next year. So thank you all for joining us. Sorry to have gone over, over time by, by about five minutes, but I think it was really valuable to, to hear those final points. So thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.